to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Goins here with Johnny Sobchak. Johnny, how are you today? I am doing pretty well. Doing pretty well early in the week. Um, we're, we're late, early for us in the week, but late for the podcast game. We apologize. Had some travel this weekend, so, you know. It, yeah. Um, those, it those, ears, those ears were just desperate to get our voices in them, and I'm sorry for the delay, but we're back now. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we're taking advantage of it. We have some extra stuff to talk about, uh, you know, with the extra day and uh, plenty um, to, you know, discuss everything from Spider-Man to Star Wars. Um, and then, of course, Eternals is what we are reviewing today. Um, we're roughly on the same page there, I think. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm going to have to really think back and recall <laughs> uh i know we both saw it on thursday night right we were were both there it's almost been a full night so and uh on top of that from at least my vantage point it's uh awfully forgettable in a lot of places so uh but we will certainly make do and uh, have much to talk about with regards to that one i don't think there's gonna be any shortage and then of course succession which was on sunday night episode four from season three uh another one uh, that I'm looking forward to digging into as well. So yeah, pl- plenty to digest. Definitely, definitely. We, uh, I don't know, what what did you have going on this week? And Johnny, myself, I uh, got a little, some, this is the theme of the highs and lows of, of football season uh, that we've talked about, but I was at, at the UNC homecoming game to beat Wake Forest on Saturday and uh, was there to storm the field. And then on uh, Sunday, had my heart ripped out as the Panthers absolutely <laughs> looked horrendous against the Patriots so it was a uh, you know it was it was just a an emotional weekend yeah ain't, ain't that just the way um that that is the way that is the way uh I mean, yeah, my weekend was a little bit more subdued than usual I was just kind of kicking back um I actually ended up I planned on seeing the French Dispatch over the weekend and I have seen it now but I didn't see it until last night which was Monday night so I took advantage of the extra day off um, went and saw that but over the weekend I was just a, a you know I was in in some sort of hibernation mode uh here at home <laughs> and uh got got some chores done got some boring stuff out of the way things that, that were overdue so um and just uh resting and, and relaxing but uh I did get the chance to show the Suicide Squad which came out on 4k recently and is one of the better 4ks uh, especially for newer films it was shot totally in 4k so it's native 4k the effects and all that it looks amazing but my dad hadn't seen it yet he uh didn't come to the theater and, and watch it so finally was able to show it to him at home on our big tv 4k and all that so that was fun and he he really enjoyed it was and it's typically not his you know genre or uh, i was gonna say like i don't it, like just i don't know about your dad but like if i were to show that movie to my dad i think he would just be very confused and disinterested <laughs> but well but it was I, kind I, of I I told him, good to hear that he enjoyed that yeah, no, he had fun. He had a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah, I will also say I told the same thing I told him, which was kind of a fun little full circle thing. The Suicide Squad was highly inspired by the Dirty Dozen. James Gunn, you know, said that and said that's one of his favorite films of that style and of that era. And uh, I sold my dad, my dad years ago. Now uh, he showed me the Dirty Dozen and we watched that together. So it was kind of a fun little bring it back Full around to moment. something nice. more in my wheelhouse and in the modern modern era uh, which was fun and you got spencer right you checked that out we got the the neon screeners last week to 
to get to yes. see that. I had sure seen did. it at the film festival, but on that too much because we are not reviewing it this week. But uh, next yeah. week, next week we will dive fully into Spencer. But that's uh, I'm glad you got to check that out. I know, as we said a couple of weeks ago, we were just like barely crossing paths at the film festival, so you weren't able to check that one out. But we have both seen it now, and friend of the pod, Josh Martin, will be on next weekend or next week to discuss Spencer. I, despite my football highs and lows, I was able to. I, this past week, I watched quite a lot, um, mainly on the TV front, but uh, obviously saw Eternals that we're going to talk about in a bit. Saw Red Notice, uh, which comes out. It's in theaters now, ex- like in limited theaters, and comes out on Netflix next week. So I will discuss it a little bit more once more people have seen it. Uh, Johnny, I'm not going to ask you to watch that one, so we don't have to have a full review of Red Notice, but the yeah. review is up on the site if you'd like it. It was not great. It was, I, I dare say, god-awful, um, but, uh, you know, for a, a man with a Dwayne The Rock Johnson coffee mug that uh, I can smell what The Rock is cooking at all times, but not with Red Notice. It was, it was rough. I went into it expecting like some fun popcorn action, but something that was going to be dumb and over the top. And it couldn't even give me that. So oh, more yeah, on that next week to hear uh, you of all people really just uh, kind of, I know, I know that a little bit. So it was, it was no fun, but on the TV front, I finally, finally caught up with squid game, finished that I'd been working my way through that with Rebecca for basically like since it came out, which we were, we were like a week or two, like a week late to it. And then we like, didn't binge it necessarily. We took our time through it. So finished that thought it was pretty good. I didn't see it to be like as groundbreaking and like earth shatter, you know, like for that first week when it was just like everywhere, like, yeah. I feel like it was, people were talking about it as like the best show of the year. Like it was good. It was entertaining, but it's probably like fifth or sixth, maybe okay. seventh, like on my, on my list for the year. But Wow. I did see, okay. I did, um, well, I, so this is, this is fun. So you watch um, a lot of television to be fair. Right. Right. I was going to qualify that here that, uh, last year I, in all of 2020, when I finished like my, uh, my rankings and everything for 2020 TV, I watched 17 shows or sorry, 17 shows uh, total throughout the year, 15 of them being like 2020 releases. Um, And this year I'm already at, let's see, 22 total on the year and 17 uh, 2021 releases with obviously basically two months left in the year and a lot of things I still want to check out. So I've been diving into TV a bit more this year. And uh, one of those that I binged this past week was a show called hacks, which I know I'm super late to. It's a comedy on HBO max <laughs> uh, with Jean smart. And she won the best comedic actress Emmy for it. So I knew that it was great. I knew that I just needed to get around to it. And I, it was a quick watch, 10 episodes, 30 minutes each. Uh, and that was fantastic. I'm sure I will be talking about that more towards the end of the year when I'm ranking everything. And I started a new show, The Shrink Next Door, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Avery on our fall TV preview that comes out this coming week on Apple TV Plus. And I, I'm two episodes into that with Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd. And I'm very intrigued by where it's going. So okay. we'll have to uh, stay tuned as that that's going to be a week. I think they come out with two episodes this Friday and then it's going to be weekly. So I will we'll have to check back in with that as the season rolls on. But Lots of TV going on here and a few movies, but it's been, and of course, Succession, keeping up with that, so. <laughs> yes, uh, Succession, yeah, that's the main the main uh, event every week at this point now. Uh, do we want to hop into episode four? Let's do it. I actually just, like I said, because I, so I, I was home for the weekend, didn't get to watch it, so I just watched it this afternoon before we're getting on a podcast, so it is all fresh for me another really really solid episode i i still think three was my favorite so far but this one was uh yeah a lot a lot of big stuff happening here we get some really great character moments from our favorites and also from uh, a new look at the adrian brody character in this episode what did you think of of everything that went down in in four yeah i thought three is definitely the best i think of this season one of the best ever i think 
Uh, and then I honestly, I think this is probably the weakest of the first four. I mean, it's still really great. I mean, it's still succession. I feel like, I like thought this was a little bit harder to kind of piece together exactly where the story was going, what was happening with the characters. It was a little bit more scattershot as far as the narrative goes. As soon as I was kind of getting comfortable in one scene or situation, it would kind of pivot to something else or a, certain, a different group of characters. But overall, still really good. The acting, top notch. There's a, They're introducing some new things in this episode as well. As you mentioned, the Adrian Brody character of Josh, which was really the focal point of the episode. I guess you'd call it kind of like the A plot. And then the other stuff that we got to see was bouncing between Tom and Shiv, Tom and Greg, uh, the uh, situation with Jerry Roman and Jerry and Roman and what Roman's doing to kind of leverage things against Kendall potentially. And it, it just seemed kind of like out of left field and, and kind, of, kind of funny and weird, but uh, not anything that I thought was really enlightening or, or super interesting. Really, yeah, it, I mean, it was it, the Logan and Kendall show with right. Adrian Brody's character there. Right. I feel like I'm, a lot happened, but not a lot happened at the same time, if that makes sense. Definitely. like yeah. Because like in what was happening, those were big things that were important, but like they took up the whole episode. I feel like so far it's been really like not frantically paced, but a lot has been going down in each episode and it's been yeah. quick moving from from place to place, discussion to discussion. But this was like, we're spending the whole episode with Logan and Kendall and Josh in one place talking about this. Or we're, and then like, basically it was like, that's what needs to happen in episode four. And how do we fill the time for everybody else? Again, right. like still a great episode, still the best show on television right now. Like I, I'm not criticizing it whatsoever to because I still enjoyed like what happened with the other characters. But in comparison to what we've seen everybody doing in one through three these were like the least detrimental actions for everybody that wasn't kendall logan and josh right yeah well that's the thing i think even with the logan and kendall situation with josh that whole plot throughout throughout this episode it doesn't they don't really do anything like it doesn't really there's no new information share. There's nothing that really happens. I mean, Kendall doesn't even tell Josh anything that he doesn't know. Uh, and maybe that is... because oh, And it also, like, it felt like... I mean, obviously that was intentional because it felt like Josh was just kind of, like, dicking around. Like, he brought them out there just to, like... Fuck oh, with yeah, them, he was basically. definitely, like, trying to get them to cave to some extent, which ultimately does happen because of Logan... I First off, he gets to see what the dynamic is like between Logan and, and Ken when they're out of their element. They're not in the city. Uh, they're kind of thrown into the situation. And it's a it's a mess, of course. And then there's the, the element at the end of this episode where uh, Logan is not feeling well. He collapses kind of and they, you know, he sees he sees the weakness, literal physical weakness in in uh, Logan. And that scares him to some degree. Now, I'm curious what you think about what Josh was intending to do with this whole plan. Did he did well, he want Logan to collapse eventually? Or well, was it something that just kind of happened? Yeah, I mean, I don't, like, I don't know. Because, like, it seems like, obviously, like, like we said, he was just kind of, like, jerking them around out here. And... By the because like at the very end you see that Stewie is like arriving and he's there and like Josh gives him this big hug and they're like it's clear that they have a way better relationship than Josh has with either Kendall or Logan and yeah. like I know they have their private helicopters but like it's not like he got there that quickly after seeing Logan collapse like this guy was going to be here regardless I would imagine so it's like it seems like Josh knew from the top that regardless of what happened here that he was still going to have Stewie come over and that they were still going to be moving forward together. And that this kind of just reaffirmed that. Um, but I don't know, like, I, I was kind of confused by the whole like walking there because like, as they're walking through the beach, like through these, these trails, like, it's like he, d he lives here. This is his Island. And he doesn't even like know the way back to his house that they just like walked out to yeah, here. That, so that it was, seemed, it seemed very yeah. like misleading like literally misleading them uh 
But then once he did collapse, it was clear that he was like, Kendall tries to get down to business with him. And he's like, let's worry about your dad right now. And he seemed like very concerned. Like, I don't know if that was, a, I don't want to have this old man die on my property and me be liable or if it was like genuine care for him. So I don't, I don't know if he was like, if the whole plan here was to have Logan collapse, but I think that the plan was not to ever move forward with the Roy family. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely get the feeling that he was predisposed to not moving forward with them or to not remaining, I suppose, loyal to them. Uh, but also it seems that there might've been a chance if they had just been competent, if they had just said something, given him something that he could feel more comfortable about or something he could act on positively. But I mean, Logan it, got it, to it say his, nothing. Logan got to say nothing. his piece. Yeah. Logan said like his whole thing, basically complimenting Kendall. And then it was revealed that that was just bullshit. Like as they were walking back. So do you think that was that enough to sell Josh had Logan not collapsed on the walk back? Would do you think no. that they would have been good? Or do you think it was still even post delicious seafood lunch that nobody touched except for like one clam? <laughs> what a waste. Yeah. But uh do you think that it was always like once they left that table, Josh had his mind made up that it was already a no-go? I think that the him collapsing was not the de defining moment. I, I think that that was just kind of a almost like a metaphor i suppose but i i just think josh was very i mean he was skeptical skeptical when they got there so right that i mean there was that was the reason he called them out there in the first place uh I, I he wanted to see how much they could take how much shit they could take from him and he wanted to see if they're you know what their response might be how they in a private setting um on the ropes essentially how are they going to present themselves and they don't really do anything good i mean you it's to one to, to one uh, you know side of it you can understand because they are logan and kendall are enemies effectively at this point kendall says that uh when logan is is trailing behind them he's talking to josh and josh asks you know what do you have on him and he says you know i can't say legally but it's not looking good and, you know, Josh is pressing him, like, do you want your dad to go to prison? I mean, what's going on here? And that's obviously a very uncomfortable, unhealthy situation for Josh. And he, he says this to them directly, which I thought was great. He says, you, you know, you work for me. You know, I'm the shareholder. Right. You people operate to give me my best, uh, you know, interest. And, and they are clearly incapable of doing, doing that at this point. And I think anyone, I mean, you don't have to be a, a you know, market analysts to see that this is not a tenable situation and that Stewie and Sandy are clearly the better option. But we know these characters and to some degree, at least with Kendall, maybe we want to see them succeed, I guess, to just, you know, a degree. Uh, they're in a predicament, but you kind of feel bad and, and sympathize or empathize to some degree. So that was in, that was certainly the most interesting part of the episode from a you know story standpoint from the characters and the acting. I thought Adrian Brody, as much as I you know have my uh, bad feelings or negative feelings around him, I, th I thought he was really good in this role. I thought he played it. He played it, he played it like an asshole, and he played it like he was uh, you know owed something and he was entitled to something, um, and he uh was very uh he just had that right or to him like he really believed that he was kind of this rich wealthy um you know kind of asshole and that's that's really how he acted and that's how he came across and, and of course you can argue that oh, he has every right to be an asshole and and these you know kendall and logan they don't you know who cares if anyone's an asshole to them they are they're more than deserving of it so um but i thought that was great and then of course there's the elements going on with shiv and tom and greg and and we can probably get to that a little bit more as well yeah, I was going to say that outside of the the island, um, it was two characters had were traveling in opposite trajectories as far as their their status here. I think that this was a great episode for Greg as a character. Um, 
obviously we get that initial sequence where the, the episode starts with him freaking out because Logan wants him to come immediately to meet with him and uh great character moments for Greg just like good laughs first of all just saying I'm a sturdy birdie and, <laughs> and then his like whole rum and <laughs> like Logan has this fancy liquor cabinet with like spirits and Greg's like oh can I have a uh I'll take a nice rum and coke and they have to like fetch him coca-cola and he chugs it but anyway he had he had some good like funny moments but also like it's clear that he is in a powerful position right now he's trying to He's currently with Kendall. He's being wooed by Logan, who basically tells him, like, tell me what you want. I'll make it happen and we can we can do this. So then we later hear him like gaming out his future. He wants to move to parks and find a way to to succeed there. Yeah. Um, so really, really good stuff for him. I think that he's going to be uh, he's obviously like an important player and everything here and that they the the rest of the family wants to get him away from Kendall so that gives him a lot of leverage and power um but then a really bad episode for Shiv as oh, she's yeah. continuously been promised from Logan like it's you you're going to be the one I'm grooming you for this and now she has this new title and she got punked last episode by Kendall so the respect was already kind of like she was seen as a joke almost and now moving forward like Logan keeps undercutting her and getting mad at her for taking action that she believes she's been instructed to take in this case it was um what's the guy's name the blonde guy Carl um yeah like basically Carl and Frank were just like having lunch and screwing around and Shiv asked them for an update and then we later hear that Carl reported to Logan that Shiv like overstepped her boundaries and stuff. And Logan is siding with Carl. So disappointing to see there as far as like what Logan has told Shiv and to see her kind of get her wings clipped, but really just not, not looking good for her moving forward. So I think Mm. Greg is slowly siphoning Shiv's power away from her as he's turning into a new top dog at the company. Yeah. Shiv is in a bad way at the moment. Um, and it's, even Connor was talking to her. Even oh, Connor, Connor was talking bad to her. Off. Yeah, Connor, he was, uh, I mean, he was not taking no for an answer in this episode, which was uh, certainly a change of pace and a different shade of that character than I think we've even seen ever uh, in the show. He, Honestly, even just seeing him in an episode this season, like we've seen him in maybe like a combined like six minutes of screen time through four yeah. episodes. So it's yeah. nice to see him like, bring himself here rather than being summoned for something yeah he yeah he takes the initiative pops in there you know kind of catches shiv with her fucking pants down and really just says hey um you're not you're gonna give me something you're not gonna try to get away with this and he pulls out i mean it's really a a tantamount to blackmail uh but you know what how you feel about that doesn't really matter because they're all just shit anyway but I thought that was really interesting and kind of a shocking, funny moment of the episode. And then, of course, there's the Tom and Greg stuff, which is happening where you have uh, Greg, you kind of mentioned this, but he is, he's on his way. He has leverage and, and has opportunities ahead. But also, you know, Tom, he is in he's like in the opposite situation. So he feels like he's going to prison. Greg feels like he's on his way to whatever position he wants in the company lays it all out for Tom. And then Tom, you know, they have this kind of, you know, I feel like it's going to be kind of this iconic scene or moment now, you know, looking back at it uh, for the rest of the show. But Tom tells the story about, you know, Nero and, and how he took the slave. (laughs) He killed his wife. I'd castrate for you. (laughs) took his favorite slave boy and and castrated him and married him and dressed him up like his dead wife um and of course i mean this is it's just tom and shiv and and (laughs) greg is the castrated slave boy um it's almost like the dialogue and the story of it and the the way it's played it feels like very much game of thrones which i thought was kind of funny um but yeah that was and then they get into like this weird faux wrestling match where tom is just like Tom is so desperate 
for affection and someone to actually love him. And he clearly loves Greg, like to some degree, maybe it's not real, but he is, he has feelings for, for Greg. And Greg, of course, is not really reciprocating that, at least in the way it's being presented by Tom, which is admittedly creepy and weird, but it's just, it was very sad, very funny, but yeah, it's, it's like, I don't know what to make of Tom and, and he's, I mean, he's on the ropes. I mean, if any, I mean, he's probably on the ropes, maybe more than anyone else at this point, at least in his head, he feels so threatened and so at risk um, even more so than someone like Logan, maybe. Right. I, I put solid, like on our notes here, I put solid Tom episode, but I mean that in the sense it was a great Matthew McFadden episode, the actor that plays Tom. Not a good episode, as we were just talking about, like a good episode for Greg, not in the same sense for Tom here. He, uh, he's not in a good place. He's in trouble. And his underling that he once manipulated and had so much power over is now, like you said, like choosing his own adventure in this company while he's looking up toilet wine recipes and and figuring out which prison is best for him so yeah (laughs) again like that that lended itself to some great moments like entertaining character moments but it's not looking good for for tom the the whole tom and shiv as a couple just not not looking good for either of them and i hopefully sweet tom is so like he's the only wholesome him and greg like i mean i know tom has made his mistakes but like I feel like a lot of this is like, he's just been dragged into this family and is so over his in over his head that like, I feel like he's him and Greg are easy to root for because they're so wholesome and pathetic. innocent and pathetic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pathetic so I hope that I'm, I'm like, it makes me happy to see Shiv like, because she's so manipulative. Like, oh yeah. Her getting some of her own medicine, but it, yeah. it hurts me to see Tom like this. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, feel no misgivings about like shiv getting like eating shit like she is terrible she is not a good person by any stretch but also you know greg and tom do come off as the most likable and like characters you can root for because they are so like downtrodden by everyone else but uh, like also i don't necessarily i wouldn't necessarily say i root for them like i root for them in the same way that i root for kendall even though i know he's bad like I, I know that there are worse people that he's like kind of facing off against. So it's like, it's a very, again, that's why I think this is one of the most interesting, compelling and best shows because of all these characters and how dynamic they are. Again, not just episode to episode even, but from scene to scene or moment to moment where the, the shifting dynamics are going on. That is so interesting, even in an episode like this, where as we mentioned at the top, maybe not a lot happens, if anything, but you're kind of pulled along by where it's going between the characters and, and, you know, throughout the episode. Well, we're almost at, we can have a, a better evaluation uh, after next week's episode, because that'll officially be the halfway point of the season, but through four episodes, who has been your MVP so far um, in terms of like who, who's in the best position has done the most for themselves throughout the first four episodes to, to be in a good spot here. I mean, Greg is definitely in the best spot as far as, I mean, especially re- relative to where he was at. I mean, you know, at the end of season two, I mean, that he didn't really have anything necessarily. He, he sided with Ken and took a big risk. Now he is sided back with Logan and is reaping the potential benefits of that. Now that, that was also, it, I, I'm, I'm not sure like, Tom told Shiv that he got Greg to sign. Like we never saw Greg sign, right? So right. do we know for sure? Like, I feel like Tom was just like, Tom just said that to Shiv and Shiv immediately passed that along to her dad for approval. And then he told that to Kendall. So th- I know a lot of people have said that, but I don't know if it's like official, official that he's flipped or not. But I think yeah. it could be coming. I mean, that's, that's fair. That's a fair point. Um but what's well, the caveat to all that as well, even if you had signed is, well, the FBI showed up at the, at the end of last episode. We know going to next episode, there's going to be some sort of legal element to it. Um, 
you know, if, if Logan goes down, does Greg, you know, is Greg at risk? And we know Tom's at risk, but I wonder if there's anything there where Greg could, you know, potentially be in trouble or face some real consequences. Uh, Cause that, then of course that would be, uh, you know, qu- quite a sticky situation for him. Kendall though, I feel is still in a really good spot. I think objectively, like he, he again, took an even bigger risk than Greg at the end of season two. And now he's built up, he has a great legal team. He's working on like this, you know, kind of immunity with DOJ and these other things and, and is working to kind of position himself as the public alternative to Logan. So um, there is that letter that Shiv did a lot, you know, at the end of uh, episode three, but we'll see, you know, we'll see how much that, that affects things or how that shakes out. Yeah, I'm with you. Still team Kindle and Greg as far as who's got yeah. the, the the best power, the most the, the best position right now. So I still think that uh everybody on the Roy side of things is scrambling to to catch up. So we'll see what happens. Like I said, I'll we'll we can bring that question up again next week once we're at the official halfway point. But still still a great great season so far and and we're excited to continue but shall we get into the news of the week johnny let's do it all righty people have been begging everywhere speculating left and right for the next spider-man no way home trailer i feel like this tends to happen we're going to record this episode it'll drop tomorrow um (laughs) who knows but uh what we did get uh, it's coming soon the the final trailer here but what we did get is a poster for it, which is the first poster that we've seen so far. Everything, movie theaters were having to use fan-made posters because they Sony had not <laughs> released an actual one. But now we have yeah. one. Um, and with that poster comes the anticlimactic first look at the Green Goblin in the MCU, who's about two centimeters tall, uh, in the far background, blurred out of the poster. Uh, was this how you were expecting to, for Willem Dafoe to make his comeback into the MCU, Johnny? It was not. Um, I'm not going to go on about this too much. I did have a couple tweets to this, basically the effect that you just, uh, you know, verbalized of, wow, I didn't really, you know, I don't know what I expected and I'm still disappointed, that kind of meme thing. Um yeah it's just i mean who cares posters aren't that big a deal these days i mean i know this was like the first one for this movie so people were looking forward to it or expecting things from it but really nothing to see here it's the same shot of him basically from the trailer uh on top of like the car but they've photoshopped him onto something else i guess it seems like Um, it looks like just some general wreckage general Um, probably that that bridge question mark um, but we have some Doc Ock arms, which is, you know, cool details on that. That looks pretty good. Um, but yeah, and then the, the far background is the green goblin, Willem Dafoe. After two decades, he's back. We've got uh, some lightning as well. So that's electro. And you know, uh, it looks like, I don't know if it's dust or smoke or, or what, but could be a, a little Sandman tease as well. Sure, 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 sure. So, you know, from what I understand, I'm pretty sure Goblin is going to be in the second trailer. Um, the trailer should be out in the next week or so. Sony is, release, is releasing Ghostbuster, Ghostbusters next Friday. So you would imagine, you know, big Sony movie. They're going to release another big Sony trailer right before it. Uh, I really don't know why they felt the need to push this poster out like this so quickly um, before the trailer. I think this would have been a lot more effective and made a lot more sense if it, they, you know, you drop the new trailer, um, you know, this week or next before Ghostbusters and it, maybe it, it probably features Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin. That's what I've heard at least. Um, and you, you have him in there, you reveal him on film in the context of the trailer, you reveal maybe some of the other characters. Uh, and then, then you drop this poster like right after or something. Um, I don't really understand the logic uh sony has been just so all over the place they've had a i don't know i I think it's just a horrible mess of a kind of marketing run for this so far i mean the trailer was obviously a huge hit i mean people really seem to like it and they watched but that also the trailer happened because of leaks so it's not like it was even like released on their own term which also be careful on social media i know you've kind of 
seen some stuff. I've been trying to avoid it as much yes. as possible, but this yeah, like left and right new stuff is getting leaked from this yeah. movie. So, so yeah, if anyone's huge... out there who, who is not yeah. wanting to have this spoiled, then be careful. Yes. Be careful. Um, uh, yeah, the leak stuff it, it's <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is a thing and it's just like okay well by the time we get to this movie which is still well you know it's over a month away you know what are we really gonna have to to look forward to or be surprised by i don't know i mean i'm not not you know i'm not trying to doomsay or or be a negative you know whatever but i'm excited i'm excited for this i've been looking forward to this since you know the the first details were kind of coming out i hope it's good i think it has potential to be good but i'm also nervous and kind of getting not burnt out necessarily, but like, oh God, I'm just, just tired of the same, more of the same. Like we're hearing more stuff. pictures from the bridge, <laughs> more pictures from the bridge, Tom Holland laying down some quotes. Um, well, I know you, you said that there's not much that's going to surprise us by the time it comes out. But if, uh, if this is true, then we might be in for some surprises because Tom Holland has said that no way home is quote brutal and quote the best Spider-Man film they've ever made quote it's not fun this film it's dark and it's sad end quote so we're expecting this fun comic book movie i nothing that i think you had pointed out nothing that we've seen so far indicates that this will be neither dark nor sad so (laughs) maybe there are surprises that are waiting for us yeah i mean it's possible uh can't rule it out obviously tom holland would know more about it than me but, uh, but he's also notorious for spoiling things and is now like oppositely notorious for saying fake things to try and not spoil things. So, right. And also, yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, it's marketing talk. I mean, who knows, you know, what to think about this, but let's, I'm just, let's, let's see what the trailer brings. I hope the next time we're talking about this movie on here, it'll be, you know, next week, next week's episode, maybe, or the week after that with the trailer discussion agreed well there is some uh you know to to quote tom holland some dark and sad news that's been happening uh obviously there's been quite some beef over the years between vin diesel and dwayne dwayne johnson uh in regards to the fast saga you know dom toretto and luke hobbs never saw eye to eye in the movies and, and they never saw eye to eye on set either and as a result Luke Hobbs was forced out of F9 and spun off into the Hobbs and Shaw movie. But now, could this beef be squashed? Johnny, what do you think? Vin Diesel has, he did it. He little brothered Dwayne The Rock Johnson on Instagram, asking him to come back for F10. Let me read this quote for you. Caption on the photo from, I believe it's from Fast Five of uh vin diesel of of dom toretto with his hands out like this is the streets based up against the special agent luke hobbs but vin stretched the photo to make himself look even bigger so that's already a a red flag but the caption says my little brother Dwayne, the time has come the world awaits the finale of fast 10 as you know my children refer to you as uncle Dwayne in my house There is not a holiday that goes by that they and you don't send well wishes, but the time has come. Legacy awaits. Wow, a a car just revved its engine outside of my window. It's perfect for this fast (laughs) news right here. Legacy awaits. I told you years ago that I was going to fulfill my promise to Pablo. That's Paul Walker. I swore that we would reach and manifest the best fast in the finale that is 10. I say this out of love, but you must show up. Do not leave the franchise idle. You have a very important role to play. Hobbs can't be played by no other. I hope that you rise to the occasion and fulfill your destiny. Johnny, what was your reaction to this earth-shattering comment? Um, uh, I mean, I obviously don't care (laughs) about this series. Like, obviously, Heartbreak never was in any of these in any of these movies, which apparently. There's a only one or two left, uh, presumably, at least in the main. That saga. that's another another piece of news from this is that it's been they they've said that it's going to be Fast Ten and Fast Eleven, but he refers to the finale that is Fast Ten. So I'm not really sure what uh 
what to take from that. Well, maybe, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I really don't know. Um, it's, it is unclear. Yeah, you, you are right. But what I think about this is, you know, there probably was real beef between Vin Diesel and the rock, uh, you know, on set while filming, maybe that's why the rock has not been around the last few entries. Uh, you know, it's kind of been pretty well, well documented. There was, right. There was legit like during, um, man, during my binge, they all kind of run together, but one of the movies like Hobbs is in the hospital for most of it after getting injured at the start. And it was because like they, Vin Diesel and the rock, like couldn't film a scene together because their egos were too big. Like they didn't want to be, so they just like separated them for the whole movie. Yeah. They're just, uh, they're, they're full of themselves. And like, like you were saying though, like it, there should, there could be like some truth to this, but also like, the rock is a former wrestler. Like this is, this seems like something straight out of like WWE, like the way that they have their like decades old feuds, like between characters. And then they return to for one last showdown or something like this seems like something stripped straight from like uh, a WWE SmackDown special or something like that, that this is going to be an epic. He's going to return and it's going to be some epic conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely reminiscent of that. And that's kind of what I was getting at is that whatever really did go down or, you know, whatever was between them, clearly this is, this is not something Vin Diesel just went, you know, on his own about and decided to write up and tweet like this is, or post, like this is it clearly like a bit of marketing, um, you know, I'm sure behind the scenes, him and the rock have probably already, you know, the, at the end of the day, these guys are a performers and actors. So they are very good at, at faking things and making things seem like something that they actually are not. And also they are businessmen. They have gotten to this point because they have made business decisions that have allowed the franchise to grow and expand. They've gotten their, their bags out of it, no doubt. And financially, it makes the most dollars and cents to bring The Rock back into the franchise for this finale, make it even bigger and better. The Rock is a huge draw all on his own. So why not include him? Well, I think both of them could see through whatever nonsense they had going on that that would be the right decision. And Plus um, with, with John Cena in there as well. Think about the... Like with John Cena having joined an F9, like if you had those three together, just imagine the, the explosion on screen. But you said it's not something that he like just randomly posted. I'm curious, like to me, when I see this, first of all, is it sincere? Because he's posting it on Instagram. This wasn't a, you know, a private discussion between the two. Like if this was a genuine, like, hey, buddy, we need you to come back to do this. Like, like you said, maybe there was that discussion beforehand and this is the theatrics for it, but starting off your sentence with my little brother, Dwayne, Vin Diesel's 54, Dwayne is 49. So yes, Vin is older, but in this world from coming from a football locker room myself, like little brother wasn't so much, it was like, it wasn't like an insult necessarily, but like people always said like, oh, that's my son. Or like, they called you son. And it was like, you didn't want to get sunned by somebody. So like, this seems, this has a very similar vibe to that. Like this is, if, if this is genuinely him wanting to like recon, re, like squash the beef, rekindle the relationship, my little brother, Dwayne does not seem like the best way to go about doing it. Yeah, exactly. And that's my whole point is that this is, uh, this is not something that the, the rock did not see this message for the first time when it was posted on Instagram, like everyone else. There's no way that that's something that would have been allowed uh, or would have flown with anyone. So uh, I don't think that, uh, it, it, again, this is just marketing. I mean, look at us. We're talk- we've been talking about this shit for the last 10 minutes that, that Vin Hell Diesel yeah. posted about The Rock and Fast Family. And 10. So that's what they're doing. They're putting on a show and, you know, well, I guess we'll see what happens with Fast 10 because The Rock's going to be back. I think this is effectively, this is an announcement that The Rock is back. And hey, maybe he we'll can't, see. He can't not. I mean, honestly, like with this out there, 
but that's another thing by doing it on Instagram. It's like, this isn't a closed doors conversation. This is now putting the onus on the rock. Like if you don't come back, like, look, yeah. everyone knows that you turn this down. Like exactly this, yeah. this is, and it's like, again, saying Hobbs can't be played by no other. Like, I mean, it's not like they're going to recast the character to finish out the arc or anything like that. You know, no. like they would, the character, if the rock says no, like Hobbs is just not in the movie. So, yeah. And, and all, I mean, alternatively, and we'll see here in a few, uh, you know, months or weeks. So, you know, they're, they're starting to, uh, they're, they're clearly gearing up for this movie now. I'm sure it's going to be a big production. It'll be going on next year, I think. Um, you know, hey, maybe we'll see Gal Gadot work her way back into the fold as well. You know, we just had The Rock and, and her work on Red Notice. So, and there's been plenty of discussion about her potentially coming back. I'm sure they could find a way. I mean, they have revived dead characters many times before. So exactly. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a surprise. But enough fast family talk. Let's move on to something that's pretty on brand for an Eternals episode. And that is the fact that Eternals director Chloe Zhao will reportedly direct the Kevin Feige Star Wars film. So we knew for a while now that Feige, obviously the hat man from Marvel, leading the way with uh with everything MCU related, he is set to he basically expressed interest in doing a Star Wars movie as well, obviously all under the Disney umbrella. And now they had previously gotten Michael Waldron, fellow MCU veteran who worked on Loki, was the showrunner there. He will be writing the script for this movie. And now it's not official, but Chloe Zhao is rumored to be leading the way there. What is your, I know you're, you're not a Star Wars person necessarily. What, after seeing Eternals, after knowing Chloe Zhao, what is, what is your excitement level or thoughts or just reaction to this news? It just, it happened today. So, or it was teased today. So we haven't had much time to think on it, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is not official by any means. It's a rumor or report. Um, and I think that it makes sense. I am not so sure how I feel about it. As you as you mentioned, I don't really care about Star Wars very much. I don't really care what happens with this franchise. If they never made another Star Wars anything, I probably would notice. But um, it, there's, of course, a lot of speculation and theorizing and wondering about where the movies are going to go from here. Of course, the television series are flying off the shelves on Disney Plus with Mandalorian and upcoming Obi-Wan and all these other things. Here we, uh, you know, are sitting two years from the rise of Skywalker and we were supposed to be getting Rogue Squadron from Patty Jenkins next Christmas. But we also found out, or not next Christmas, but Christmas 2023, that uh, Patty Jenkins, that movie is now delayed indefinitely. There's no release date for it. Patty Jenkins is has other things going on she's probably going to go and make wonder woman three that seems to be like it's kind of on a fast track and so that we have no idea when that's gonna happen we have no idea when the next star wars movie is going to be uh there's of course the taika waititi one that he's writing and set to direct uh we also know ryan johnson is supposedly going to be making one of his own so we so, have some options and this is one that had been on the back burner with kevin feige as as a producer and michael waldron as you mentioned writing and he did really excellent work with uh, you know, Loki, the TV show, which I was actually a big fan of, despite my kind of, uh, you know, I guess that you might say like burnout with regards to the MCU. But I think that the three of these people, even though, again, I didn't really care for Eternals that much, um, I think maybe they could come together and make something kind of fun and different. And hopefully uh, another detail that had been reported today was that this movie would be set long before any of the other films that we've ever gotten so before you know episode one long before episode one which would be either the old republic or the high republic which is, was the era right before uh the phantom menace so th there's a lot to kind of digest here or think about uh but with the writer with the director kevin feige you know he you know i have my feelings up and down about him but clearly he has uh you know acumen for doing these sorts of big films i think it could work i think it could be interesting I, I would say at the moment i'm probably more 
if all this is, is real and comes together, I'd probably be more interested in this than any of the other Star Wars projects that are, are kind of spinning around right now. But uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a mixed bag because even though Chloe Jaw is cl- clearly a talented filmmaker and I really liked Nomadland, Eternals, which we'll get to, was not it exactly. I mean, there was things I liked about it. There were things there that I thought worked. Maybe with a, you know, a better script from, from Waldron who's kind of been in, in the cosmic space with Loki and that, that kind of aesthetic um, and Kevin Feige also at, at the wheel uh, as a producer, we could get something that's not a total mess like the other dozen um, failed or canceled or delayed uh, Star Wars projects that we've gotten from Disney in the last, you know, close to 10 years now. I would, I would not be surprised to see this like this news gets finalized and this is like fast tracked to be the next Star Wars movie, especially coming so closely after the the Rogue Squadron delay. Like to have her, like, I mean, I know like Eternals is, we'll talk about the critical reception to it, but like audiences are enjoying it. It's doing well at the box office. You've got Feige who is a guy who like gets shit done. So I could see this kind of coming together very quickly and, and coming in to be the next movie. So I'm with you. I, I'm, it's very appealing. The, I still, I started the book, never finished it, but I was reading one of the high Republic books that they had come out with uh, earlier, I guess earlier this year. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see how they explore that. I, I'm obviously more open to star Wars than you are. I, would like for it not to be anything Skywalker saga related. So obviously there's a huge expansive galaxy far, far away to explore that there's so much else going on. Uh, And especially this was one of the things that with rogue squadron, that was supposed to be post episode nine to hear that this is going to be so far ahead of episode one. Like you have a clean slate, a, a, free like sandbox to play in which doesn't require as much like you know referencing or even not referencing but like if it were to be post episode nine there would have to be some like acknowledgement at least to like that you don't have to like go character by character and remind everybody like what everybody's up to but just like what is you have to reestablish like what the state of the galaxy is at, at that point but if you're beforehand it's like a like I said, a completely new, new clean slate. So that's exciting to have, which is kind of what Chloe Zhao got with Eternals to kind of be able to come up with this whole new phase of the MCU and new new main characters and, and bring that to life. So I'm excited. Um, it, it sounds promising to me. So I'm, I, I'm all in, but we hope it's moving on. We do. Yeah, this is going to be a, we'll just have to like cut this whole segment in, uh, in post if we find out that that's not actually a thing if we actually hear that um it's going to be a david fincher star wars movie tomorrow um <laughs> but another big director moving on matt damon and robert downey jr are in talks to join christopher nolan's oppenheimer film we have previously over the last couple of weeks found out that killian murphy's the lead emily blunt is going to be starring opposite him thoughts on adding these two uh two powerhouses to another big time movie like this i mean matt damon's obviously been in some some great movies but robert downey jr since his return you know with iron man hasn't really been in anything outside of the mcu that's like a prestige movie i would say so that's exciting to to kind of get him back on his uh zodiac level shit hopefully Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zodiac came out in 2007, and then the next year he was starring in Iron Man. So it's been very much, yeah, totally MCU centric. There's been, of course, some some detours to Sherlock Holmes, but that's a, you know another big budget kind of franchise, and and some other smaller movies like The Judge and and whatnot. But no, this is definitely. I mean, this is not a small movie by any means. It's a hundred million dollar Christopher Nolan movie, but it is going to have that more prestige possibility. No pun intended about you know with regards to awards potential um you know box office you know for a movie of this kind of ilk will be interesting to pay attention to and having robert Downey jr in your movie 
certainly does not hurt the box office. Um, we'll see how much of a draw he is outside of a CG uh, suit, but it's it's a good step, I think. And I think Christopher Nolan will you know benefit from his involvement. I think that'll be a really fun collaboration to see. And of course, Matt Damon, again, he's a big name, not necessarily a draw in the same way Robert, Jun- Robert Downey Jr. might be these days. Uh, and also you have to, you have to keep in mind that Robert Downey Jr. hasn't been in a movie since, um, I guess that Dr. Doolittle movie he had come out at the very oh, beginning, God. very beginning of 2020. Um, but he hasn't been in anything else since then. And this is set to be his next movie. So you're thinking almost basically four years, over four years removed from Endgame, which is where a lot of people have left off with him. That's going to be a pretty, pretty big deal, I would say, to most people. Um, so I'm excited. I think they're putting together a very, very solid cast here. I'm, I, I, you know, more reason to be looking forward to it. And of course, they're going to be in supporting of uh, Killian Murphy and, and Emily Blunt as well. But uh, hopefully, maybe we'll see some others, some other big names attached. Don't necessarily need any more big names. And we don't really know what the size of this cast is going to be like. But presumably, it's going to be something of an ensemble with the scale of the story they're uh, taking on. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exciting to be able to, like I said, Matt Damon, he was in The Martian, which was obviously a Ridley Scott epic, you know, leading man movie. He's been in the the Bourne movies, which are more, uh, obviously more action than like prestige movie, but still very, very good. Um, but Robert Downey Jr., I'm excited. Like, I freaking love Zodiac so much. I hope that he can like return to because you know his his run from during the iron man movies when he was like doing movies outside on the side of his mcu stuff you know we've got like due date uh not a great comedy with uh with zach galifianakis um let's see 2008 iron man then oh we did have tropic thunder that was right also in 2008 um the soloist that was a good movie with uh with Jamie Foxx, but Sherlock Holmes, due date, um, very brief role in Chef, then the Judge. He played the, the yeah, Chef was was a funny little character in there. Yeah, he played the uh, the corpse of Sid Shattuck in the Nice Guys. Oh, who could so forget? No, no, uh, no speaking lines there. But uh, and then, like you said, Doolittle. So not not necessarily like a great non Tony Stark run. So. <laughs> I I'm excited to to hopefully have him return to his his level there. So one final piece of news here. I know we won't spend too long on it since you are a season behind still and not necessarily planning on catching up, but we did over <laughs> the weekend get a look at Stranger Things season four. It was Stranger Things Day, aka the November uh what was that, November 6th, the day from 1984 or whatever year it was in the first season where will byers goes missing they've kind of turned this into an annual holiday where they'll tease what's to come for stranger things so got a quick little teaser for that's that's mainly uh i guess i'd say the most that we've seen from this season because the previous teaser was not really about like the characters that we know it was about this old this like family from back in the day um but it's going to be a spring break theme which is uh, a little disappointing to know that the release date is now for july 2022 i believe so we're getting a summer release of a spring break themed show which is kind of off brand since most of their stuff has been timed to like the holiday that it that it uh is set around but it looks like this is how we're going to spring break is the catalyst to get the crew reunited again because as am i allowed am i allowed to mention like what happens in season three i don't care at the end of season three 11 and will and like the buyer's family moves away from hawkins so basically in this teaser 11 is narrating or writing a letter it sounds like to mike who's back in hawkins saying that like spring break is going to be the best it's going to be like the best time ever and i assume that they are going on a trip back to hawkins or to some new venue where they're all going to meet up. So we've got our 80s vibes. We've got some explosions and some 
a mix of like 80s nostalgia and family stuff, but then also like secret agents and spies and all of the epic scale that Stranger Things has become. So I will eat this up no matter how much Stranger Things you put in front of me. I see it and I'm super excited for what's to come. I just hate that it's, we also got episode titles. I believe it was nine episodes. Um, so I'm just disappointed that it's not coming until the summer. So devastating news there. But any, any, uh, do you plan at any point to, to get caught up with Stranger Things or have you, uh, have you um, let that pass? I don't know. I feel like the ship's probably sailed, but you know, never say never. There's well, you have to, real least, disadvantage you know, you have it has is that there are so many other better shows for me to watch. I probably just won't get around to it. Wow. That's, that's, that's hard. That's rough. That's rough. Well, that is news for this week. It is time to get down to this week's main event, our review of Eternals. Five years ago, Thanos erased half of the population of the universe. But the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. The sudden return of the population provided the necessary energy for the emergence to begin. How long do we have? Seven days. We're Eternals. We came here 7,000 years ago. To protect humans from the deviants. MCU movie number 26. We are rolling deep as we venture into phase four. This is the third movie to come for phase four. We obviously had Black Widow earlier this year. We had Shang-Chi. We have had three TV shows, four if you include What If. This is the next installment from Academy Award winning director Chloe Zhao. Starring Angelina Jolie, Salma Hayek, Kit Harington, Jimma Chan, Richard Madden, Kumail Nanjiani, Leah McHugh, Brian Tyree Henry, Lauren Ridloff, Barry Keoghan. How do you say his name? Keegan. Keegan. Irish Eddie people, Keegan. man. And Don Lee. So we've got a huge ensemble here. We've got 10 Eternals plus some side supporting characters. So a lot going on here. Not, not doing so hot right now. This movie, it seems like every 30 seconds we get a new tweet that breaking <laughs> breaking Eternals has sunk to 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, which makes it the lowest. Like people are like relishing in the fact that it is uh, the biggest miss so far, at least according to Rotten Tomatoes for the MCU, is at 48% critic score right now. However, like I said earlier, audience score is 81%. I quite enjoyed this as far as like, it definitely has plenty of problems, which we'll get into. There's there's a lot of uh, too much plot. There's not enough time spent with certain characters. There's just some confusing things that don't necessarily need to be that confusing. Um, but the for, to me, the pieces are there. I I enjoyed the vision, uh, and I could see what it was going for. And I'd like you and I had discussed previously. Like it's nice to feel that they're going for something here. It wasn't just like a, a Black Widow where it was like, okay, well, we're just going to go through the MCU formula steps and uh, whatever the result is. Like, I mean, I, I enjoyed Black Widow well enough, but like it was nothing different. You can tell that they're trying to do some different things here, which, which I enjoyed. Um, wasn't my favorite Marvel movie of all time or anything by, by any means, but I gave this a 79 out of 100. Uh, it was a solid three and a half. Obviously, 79 is very close to four stars, but three and a half out of five stars for me. And uh, we'll get into why that is. But Johnny, do you have a score you want to to dish out here? Uh, um, like a 55, probably. 55? I thought you came out higher than that. I know you, it's kind of sunk a, a little bit. I gave, it, I gave it three out of five. Which three is out like, of five that's 60 that's 60 let's do some math here um About 55 rounds up so i'll put it at 55 okay okay so 55 for johnny 79 for me but while those scores may sound 
drastically different. I think that we're on the same page for a lot of stuff um, as far as like what we liked, what we wanted more of or disliked. So it'll be good. To yeah, get I into. feel I'm, I'm getting the vibe that potentially like the things that you disliked or, or, or what have you, I probably disliked more than you disliked it. Right. Like we're on the same page. It's just the extent of the, the, the severity. how much it, how much it bar, <laughs> how much it bothered us. So yeah, quick, uh, quick rundown of the plot here. Marvel Studios Eternals features an exciting new team of, I don't need the PR synopsis, Rotten Tomatoes, come on. <laughs> ancient, it's a team of ancient aliens who have been living on Earth in secret for thousands of years. Following the events of Avengers Endgame, an unexpected tragedy forces them out of the shadows to reunite against mankind's most ancient enemy, the Deviants. So not a ton of detail there. We'll try and uh, do it in our own words here, but basically the Eternals are a group of 10 immortal beings, uh, godlike beings that have been around since the existence of, or since like the inception of earth. But they've always been told never to interfere with the goings on of humanity unless deviants are involved. These are creatures um, that take a variety of shapes and they're, they're like big beasts, like uh, almost like some of them have wings some of them are like tiger based i don't know there's some some that crawl out of the ocean anyway um everything was created by the celestials which is um we've heard previously of celestials like ego the living planet from guardians 2 he's a celestial um we see celestials in uh benicio del toro as the collector when he's describing the infinity stones but yeah. this is the the first time we've seen them in this form um, they're basically the, the boss who they created the deviants, then they created the Eternals, and the Eternals are tasked with eliminating the deviants. So unless there's a deviant attack or anything like that, the Eternals can't uh, interfere with human life. So when we, we first see the Eternals like throughout the, the history of the Earth as they are uh, destroying deviants, they're living alongside humans and then we find out that they have eliminated all of the deviants and so they're just kind of stuck waiting around for for their next mission um as they're still living semi-normal lives on earth and then like the rotten tomatoes plot alludes to there is a something happens where deviants resurface and the team has to get back together and they find out that they have seven days to save the earth. We can get into some of the specifics as we venture into some spoiler sections. But before we get too deep, I want to talk about the, I feel like the big question here, the big, the big narrative is what we talked about a second ago, the reception of this movie, 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, people are bashing it. And it seems to be like, people are kind of excited to see the Marvel machine have a setback, it seems. Um, I mean, neither, I, I'm more of a Marvel fan than, than you, I would say. I'm not, not more of a Marvel fan, but more of a, I'm, I'm able to just like go along for the ride and enjoy it um, versus like being kind of, I'm still suffering from some fatigue, like you said, but not to the same extent, I would say. So mm. I'm not like celebrating. I'm not like, oh, Marvel is unable to fail, but I'm also not celebrating that they have seemingly fail i mean i mean it's not like they failed because it's still making a ton of money at the box office <laughs> but people like people are ask, acting like this is the worst marvel movie of all time like this is just like some horrendous master or like like horrendous nightmare of a movie like like i said i gave this 79 of 100 i think this is uh let me pull up my my list here but it was pretty mid to upper as far as when i ranked like re-ranked my all 26 Marvel movies. Um, I think to me, what happened here is that this movie, as far as like the expectation and reception and why people are disappointed by it, like, I don't know. I feel like having Chloe Zhao as the director, people were like, they Marvel put so much pressure on this movie as being the one that's going to be different and it being like something that, is so groundbreaking and has an academy award-winning director and then when it like wasn't like a 120 out of 100 people like freaked out and 
rated like judged it more harshly than they would judge a normal marvel movie because i think like if you take this story and this like the substance of this movie and make it a guardians movie or make it like a a captain america movie captain marvel or something maybe not captain marvel because that had its fair share of uh hate as well but something that's like a well-known ip an existing like mcu movie then i think it's solid like 65 70 percent on rotten tomatoes like no questions asked um this is 12 out of 26 on my marvel ranking so just about the middle of the pack there but this is not that bad of a marvel movie when it comes to like i mean i i obviously at 12 out of 26 like i have this well above thor the dark world and iron man 2 and ultron and thor and the original cat like there's plenty that this is better than uh, or do you feel yeah, the so same here's way the thing or people, is this your here's worst the thing marvel people movie? don't understand so one of the things that people have said on social media is uh, people defending the movie, I should specify, is that, oh, well, you complain about the Marvel formula. So now when they do something different, now you complain that it's too different. Well, honestly, first off, I haven't really seen anyone complain about it being too different um, as being why the reason why the movie's bad. And secondly, the reason why people haven't been complaining that it's too different and that's why the movie's bad is because this isn't that different from any of the other MCU movies that we've gotten. The real, the real big difference is that it is introducing many heroes at once. It's more like a Guardians of the Galaxy than an Avengers where you know all the characters previously. It's, you know, they're pre-established. They had their own solo movies. Here, you're getting them all at once and it's this big cast in this long story set over thousands of years um and i also think that you know kind of to what you were getting at discussing your ranking and whatnot this isn't that bad compared to some of these other mcu movies because a lot of the other mcu movies aren't all that great like they're good or passable or fine like some of them are and then of course there are some that are amazing or great towards the top but now that there's 25 plus movies, you know, th- there's quite a range of, of, I think, quality. And I think, you know, people, I think this is what happens when you kind of prop up this franchise to be like the gold standard of, of modern blockbuster, like cinema. I think th- that's bad for a number of reasons, but like Shang-Chi, for example, which came out just a couple of months ago. I mean, people were going nuts for that movie. I think it has like a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes and it has like a 90, a 98% like audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, which is like the highest of any comic book movie. Um, so I think there's just kind of that kind of disconnect where people have, you know, as you mentioned, that expectation and not just the expectation based on Chloe Jaws, you know, involvement in directing the movie and the Oscar discussion and all that. But because of the franchise, like they think, you know, I really, I can't really say why this has the rating that it does on Rotten Tomatoes, 47% versus some of these other bad MCU movies. Because this is not like a good MCU movie, but there are some really bad ones. I mean, I think Thor, the Thor movies, I think are both not very good. Um, Black Widow, I think is just not a very good movie. Uh, Iron Man 2 might be another one you'd want to talk about. Um regardless of what you think are the worst MCU movies, this is right, you know, I'd say this is not in, on the same level as the worst ones. I'd say it's it's close to it, but it's, it's I think it's closer to mediocre than flat out bad. Um, and so, yeah, I can't really explain why there's such a big disparity. I think if there was any logic to how these things had been panning out over the last 10 plus years, you would have more MCU movies close to this rating maybe rotten, whatever you want to call it, or in the 60s or 70s. This is far below a lot of the other ones. And that that's the element that I can't explain with regards to the reception. If you look at the tomato meter and you look at the actual average rating from all the reviews, it's a 5.6 out of 10, which is not good, obviously. I mean, I said it's, what, a 55 out of 100? That's yeah. still, I think, to me, that that's mediocre. That's not bad. That's not, you know, terrible. That's just a kind of middle of the road movie. Um, so I think it, it, there's a lot to like digest and like break down there, but um, it's certainly overblown. I don't think it's one of the worst comic book movies of all time. There's worse ones. Um, Black Widow, I think, is worse than this movie. Uh, but 
you didn't see Black Widow get the negative reception. Maybe because it was, you know, a character we were familiar with or just a simpler story. I I, I can't really explain it. I don't know, but I, I will say while we're that. while we're talking uh, tomato meter, the fact that Red Notice is forty four percent and Eternals is forty seven percent is absolute yeah. sacrilege. Like the I I again, I'll talk more about red notice once more people have gotten to see it next week but <laughs> let me just say those two movies are not in the same ballpark in terms of quality like okay that's yeah. that's disrespectful so I, I i'm with you i don't know why it's it's why it is so far below what the other marvel movies are considering like it's better than in my case half of them so yeah agreed well not let's, agree with that exact thing but i hear what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, let's. One of the things you mentioned is the plot that it is a lot, and we're definitely on the same page there. Again, to different extents, how much it bothered us, but this story unfolds over. Let's go ahead and throw a spoiler warning out there, um, just in case we venture into any territory. We're going full spoiler, baby. Full spoiler, but this movie unfolds over like you said thousands of years the eternals have literally been around as long as earth has we see them in like ancient mesopotamia defending people from deviance um we see them throughout history at the fall like the the sacking of tenochtitlan or um like the ancient mayans like we see them (laughs) at hiroshima we see all sorts of things um and while we're seeing all of the the different times that they've like the different times that time periods that they've existed we're getting to know these characters like i said 10 eternals there's so many of them um <laughs> and like that's like i i enjoyed pretty much every character um obviously we get them to like varying degrees your jimma chan and and richard madden as cersei and icarus are obviously like very main characters here compared mm-hmm. to you know like i loved B- fastos brian tyree henry and druig barry keegan's character both of them were in it not as much as the main two but you know i, w- I wish we'd had more of them um yeah. i'd say probably like Thena, angelina jolie and gilgamesh don lee's character those are both like more tertiary if we're like separating them into tiers as far as like screen time and importance um but it's just there's there's a ton on the plate here um for them to do you know you're introducing all these characters you're establishing for the first time really like what celestials are like like i said we've seen them a little bit but we never knew like what they are what they do we're learning about deviants we're learning about eternals we're learning about these individual characters as well as the lore of their like type of character and and how they work um all while unpacking thousands of years of character history and learning how they are in the now uh and what their current relationships are like versus what they were like thousands of years ago Uh, a lot of that is seen through the eyes of cersei and icarus as they were together as a couple for thousands of years and then in the present day they are not um but there was just so much. And, and then of course, like, wow, that's all, that's everything I just said is like all exposition and like setting the table. And then you've got like everything that's happening in the present with the actual plot, as far as, you know, we find out that the Eternals were sent here to earth uh, to destroy the deviants because the earth was basically like impregnated with a new, um, celestial that was going to be born and it needed people on earth to feed off of and the deviants were killing people and so they had to um basically destroy the deviants to allow the people to live and once the people hit a certain threshold then the celestial can be born and it'll destroy earth and everyone on it but the new celestial will be able to then create further galaxies so that's all unfolding and they have they have decided to stop that celestial from being born so while you're just developing everybody and explaining everything that's going on you also are 
creating a or trying to create like a compelling plot in the now and a villain and an antagonist and and action to to get from point a to point b and and stop it so there's just so much on its plate um that i mean i i that my best I, I the best way to put this is that this would have been the best disney plus marvel show that has happened yet like if we had gotten a 10 episode <laughs> A 10 episode span of, yeah. I mean, obviously you've got Chloe Zhao directing. I don't think you can get the Academy Award winning direct best director to immediately make the jump to a Disney plus streaming show. Yeah. Uh, but like my, like walking out of the theater, I was like, wow, that would have been great as the show lost. Like, I don't know if you watched the show back in like the like early yeah. 2000s, but like you've got all these people who are playing or like, plane crashed on an island and everything's happening in the now and each episode has like a flashback to like in season one a flashback to the person off the island and learning about them like if you had you know an Icarus you could even like an Icarus and Cersei episode where you're learning about them throughout the years and then like stuff is still happening in the present and then you've got a Kingo episode and you've got a a Sprite episode like it it would have I think it would have been a tremendous success that way because you have all of the time that you need to flesh out all the characters and and not try and this is the second longest mcu movie that we've had second to end game and it still like was not nearly enough time to like fit in everything that they wanted to fit in here i don't know if you i i assume you feel this, the same way here yeah um god you're right on about the whole you know, the one thing I would, you know, maybe disagree with or point out is that if you do Disney Plus in, you know, a streaming whatever, if, you know, you lose some of the grand, uh, you know, scale maybe or something like that. I think there's something to be said for the size and the visuals of these, you know, for example, the Celestials in the movie. Um when they do appear on screen, it's, it's, you know, I saw it in IMAX, like it's a huge, amazing image. And it's like, you really understand how powerful and, and controlling and, and big these beings are. So of course you're going to lose some of that, but you are, you would be gaining a lot with regards to screen time for all the characters that you have and the depth that you can build in those characters and build uh, with between them and their relationships and that was something that the film definitely struggled with uh because i really liked you know we're talking about the characters i loved i thought Druig was probably my favorite uh and i think barry keegan is just a really great young character actor and i thought that he brought the most Really, I thought the most, you know, personality to his character, with the exception of maybe Kingo, who is very, you know, kind of, you know, over the top, fun, uh, right, charismatic, ego maniac almost character. Which, I, but he did it well, and he did it even in a way that still managed to be endearing in a lot of ways. They're on opposite. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yes, as far as exactly. Like, they're they're both the biggest characters, but in like different ways. Like I think yeah. I'm with you. Druig was him and Makari as a couple, like individually as characters, but also like they're. We didn't really get to explore their romance, but it was clear that there was something there. Um, and and like they even acknowledge that like i wish that that had been forget cersei and icarus like give me the makari and druig <laughs> love story like if you're gonna if you're marvel and you're having your first sex scene in this in the history of the mcu like do it with a couple that like in the 30 seconds of like flirtation between makari and yeah. druig like that was more chemistry than icarus and cersei had in the whole movie yeah which I mean, was it's... surprising because like Richard Madden as Rob Stark, the young wolf, like he was so, so charming and like, yeah. and, and like a, a great character and with his, um, oh, what's her name? Why can't I think of it? Um, his wife in the show. Yeah. With his wife that RIP yeah. uh, Red Wedding, but, um, but like those two together were like, we didn't have much time with them together, but everything between them felt real and like, a great romance but 
it just what none of that charm and he was very like i mean part of it's the character and like we find out that he has actually like betrayed the eternals and knew about this plot all along and is working against their wills to or their wishes to stop this but so like part of it is him being like on the opposite side but you would think that when we do see him like in flashbacks or something that maybe he'd be a little more more warm and charming but he was kind of my most underwhelming character even though he's like the most powerful as far as you know like as a superhero goes uh he was like yeah. obviously the, the best there well <laughs> you say obviously obviously the best but we, we're saying that because that's what the movie tells us is the well case. i'm just i'm just talking in like pure like like if you're picking an eternal to take into battle like it, it's got to be icarus like like the dude with the with strength and can fly and shoot lasers out of his eye like the eternals to work well together as a team but i feel like some of them have like like cersei has some pretty lame powers in terms of like <laughs> defending herself and fighting and so like she can turn okay. like she can turn matter but like when i was seeing them all like and that different times when deviants attacked and they were kind of split up i was like man if they're like on their own like what is sprite gonna do to to be able to save herself if she didn't have like a couple other people to help so okay but they literally say in okay so there's multiple things that they say in the movie one of them is that oh icarus he's the strongest or like he's there's no way we could stop him if we needed to um but literally in a flashback earlier in the movie, they talk about how Athena could kill them all if if she wanted to. So I don't really understand, like, they're, they're all over the place when it comes to powers in this movie, which is one of my issues with it, actually. And I just thought, like, I don't... And later on in the movie, during the climactic battle, Fa- Fastos, Fa- Fastos, I think, is the, the name of the... Yeah, Fastos. Brian Tyree Henry's character. They're like, oh, there's there's nothing we can do to stop him, even if we work together. Like he's just way too powerful. Even though, again, we haven't really seen anything to that effect throughout the movie. Like the deviants have been kicking his ass just as much as they've really been kicking the ass of anyone else. Um, and then during the final battle, Fastos out of nowhere, like invents like these shackles essentially to to uh restrain Icarus, and it works for like almost the entire action scene. And, and helps, you know, them kind of get their plan to work. And, and so it's like, okay, well, Fastos clearly c- could have done at least something to keep him in place. And and uh, Makari even really takes Icarus to to, to task um, with her super speed and, and really... She did. Mean, she it, it she is so very... They, they, they crushed the... This is probably my favorite, like, iteration of super speed, like, in a comic book movie. Um like I think that it was a very effective way of displaying it and the the powers that come with it. I know, like individually as a scene, I would say like the the Flash in the in Zack Snyder's Justice League, like that whole moment. But like as far as just like overall showing like this the perks of Super Speed, I think they did really well with Makari. Yeah, the, her powers were were very cool, and that's another thing. Like we got a glimpse of her. But she and, it, and it, the way they depicted it was very interesting. I thought Chloe Chloe Zhao did a great job of that because it's not the same as Quicksilver or the Flash. It's where it's slow, super slow motion. You see it from their perspective. It's actually real time, real speed. They are she's bouncing around the world and jumping, you know, over. It seems like over oceans and, and continents. It was very. I thought that was very uh, inspired choice. Um, I we we talked a bit about the the deviants and the celestials and even Icarus betraying them. So with this movie and the, the choice of villain here, um, I will say I, I'm trying to figure, figure out how to approach this. So a lot, I, I felt different than most MCU movies because I feel like a lot of, there wasn't necessarily like a quote unquote, like big bad, if you will. Uh, it wasn't like, in, especially in, like what we just saw with Shang-Chi, like Tony Leung's character is like the bad guy or in, I don't even remember the guy's name from uh, Black Widow, but there was just like the stereotypical like bad guy that they have to get to and, and beat at the end. A lot of the conflict here was between members of the Eternals, whether that was like 
just like getting everyone back together, like settling old quarrels between the team or like literally with Icarus being going against the team that we later find out about. Um, but, you know, like you've got your deviants that are kind of like entry level bad guys. Then there's also the the Bill Skarsgård voiced main deviant who's kind of evolving. Um, and then you've also got Arishem, who's the celestial, who's been basically like lying to them and, and having them destroy these worlds over and over again. And then you've got Icarus. Like, what did you think of how they used villains? Was it too many? Like the deviants I, I people have been saying that like deviants kind of didn't really serve a perp like they could have done without them um but i will say i liked that most of it, it it felt different from other marvel movies in the sense that like it was like internal disputes rather than like we're all teaming up against one big bad guy the whole movie like obviously that happened at the end as they were having to square off against icarus but it wasn't like that the whole time yeah um it, it, the the deviants were i mean let's face it they're they're kind of like a nothing right like they're not um they're not really memorable or distinct or like interesting like they have no personality they don't have any uh consciousness it seems um except for the bill skarsgård character who doesn't have a name i don't think and is kind of alive for like part of the second half of the movie um and then gets just obliterated by cena when it like is convenient for her to do so um yeah they just they don't really do anything and and i can't understand why we get this huge x exposition dump like in the middle of the movie when we find out or not even maybe in the middle it, it was some point after um, Cersei gets the power to speak with uh, Erisham and she finds out the real story of what's going on with the Eternals and the Deviants. Um, and the Deviants are like, I can't even really remember what their purpose was or like if they had a purpose. They're out in the world. They, they were initially they were initially created I don't even remember. They were initially created for some purpose and then they realized that they were destroying people which was against the the purpose so then they had to create the eternals to reel in the the deviants yeah and like they basically say oh well they are they're they're evolving um and they're out of control and then that's when they send the eternals to basically take out the deviants but clearly the deviants you know they're the the eternals rather like the eternals themselves are kind of evolving in like some respects like they're coming becoming conscious or like they're they're having large disagreements they're supposed to be they're kind of positioned as like these robotic like servants of the well, yeah celestial. that's yeah that's like one of the reveals is that they think that they are humans that are or like living breathing things but then it turns out that they were like robots that were manufactured with these powers to serve this purpose and that they've actually been doing it time and time again and that their memories are wiped that they've actually mm -hmm. helped you know, birth so many celestials and destroyed planets and people but yeah they just you know don't what remember reminded it. me of was it, it is westworld the tv show actually to some degree <laughs> because i don't know if you've seen westworld or not i i watched like half of the first season and just never finished it but i know that the premise yeah so like they are yeah they're these kind of robotic very human-esque beings and they have you know they go out they serve their purpose which leads to potentially death and destruction and then they have their memories wiped and all these other things and that's that's basically what this is but the celestials are just really bad at quality control it seems like because they're they're the minions that they create constantly are going bad and, and ruining their plans and having issues. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's kind of this split in the team eventually, because once they find out what the real reason is of what they do, what they do, um, and why they do it, how they do it, then that is where I guess kind of, 
there's two conflicts. There's the conflicts with the deviants and the emergence. And then there's the conflict within the team itself, uh, which really kind of emerges more on the back end. Um, but the way the story is structured is just all over the place. So it's going from thousands of years in the past to, you know, hundreds of years in the past to a week ago in the past. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Okay. So I have a question for you because we have different perspectives like going into it. So I knew Icarus was the bad guy because I, I had read the uh, plot leak from earlier this year or last year. Uh, did you ever get that vibe that he was going to kind of turn and, you know, bad guy use that, you know, loosely, I guess. But did you ever have a feeling that he was going to betray them or that he couldn't be trusted or something might be amiss? Or did you have that feeling with any of the other Eternals potentially? I mean, I feel like the, I did not know that going in. I didn't think that, I didn't like see that coming until, I mean, it wasn't like a jaw dropping twist or anything. Like when it happens, when we get that flashback with him and Salma Hayek with Ajax. Um, but if anything, I feel like the trailer kind of positioned it so that you believe Druig is the the bad mm. eternal, if you will. Like, cause yeah. you, like the, the shot of him, like coming out of his little uh, cabin and the, in his community yeah. in the woods and then like kind of with it just barry keegan's like smugness almost um yeah <laughs> he has he kind of has that look to him but so i i didn't know going in i didn't i didn't from the the it wasn't like from right away i was like oh yeah i can tell it that uh icarus is gonna gonna go bad or something like that so that was that came as a surprise to me okay cool 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 well that's good um uh, but you're right about the uh druig essence like part of it he does seem like oh well he because he's really the first one to break away from the right team. he he, wow. he like rebels during the the sacking of uh tanach titlan right like when uh yes yes he's he's knows that he has the power of like mind control and he can stop these colonizers from destroying the natives and like killing them all and they're telling him like no you can't interfere yeah, exactly. So there's a, a divide kind of naturally growing there. Um, and, but I was, I was very glad to see that he was, because you hear where he's coming from, but then you also understand that he is in the wrong to some degree as well. Um, and uh, so wrapping this all back around and getting it towards the end here, how did you feel about the way the film concludes? And I'm talking about the final plot or plan to stop the emergence as well as to help the emergence because there's that split within the team and then of course the the where where it kind of leaves the characters at the end yeah so the ending is that basically icarus is like reveals that he's known this all along that he's been guiding the emergence that he killed ajak uh or basically killed her um Mm. And then we also get the reveal that Sprite has been in love with him the whole time, but she's the the child eternal. She's like in the the body of a child, yeah, uh, and has never been able to like be seen as anything more than a child. So that never worked. But she teams up with him, uh, and so that kind of derails their plan of everyone bringing their powers together to stop to let them uh, to let Druig like mind control and put the the celestial to sleep. Um, but you know, yeah, at the end of the, it's kind of the split, the, the remaining Eternals still try and come together and then they contain Icarus. And basically it comes down to Cersei, who's kind of been positioned as the new leader, as the, the main character throughout the whole movie. Uh, and she uses her previously mentioned, uh, lame powers to <laughs> change, change the matter, uh, and basically freeze the celestial as it's emerging. Like this is happening. Um, it's not like they stop it beforehand, but it's partially out of the water. And now there's just this giant alien form in the, I don't know, Pacific ocean somewhere. Indian um, ocean, I think Indian ocean, but I mean, I, I thought that the, there was obviously like CGI battle at the end, but it felt I, I didn't feel like it was just like the traditional, like I, I think we use the term like CGI slug fest or whatever. And when we were talking about Shang-Chi, like, like I said, I liked the Makari stuff. I liked all of their powers, like individual, like 
the way that they all had like unique powers and they all looked fairly good, I would say. Um, so it felt different to me um, than like your MCU slop, if you will. Um, so I, I liked that ending. I wasn't, I mean, then, then we get the split up of uh, once they do stop it and <laughs> I, I, Icarus just flies into the sun. Uh, a little on the nose there as far as uh, his name, but he flies into the sun, kills himself, assuming, I assume he kills Presumably, himself. That's, yeah. um, and then the remaining Eternals, kind of half of them return on their ship to go help other Eternals and kind of free them from this, this uh, mind control from the Celestials. And then the others, um, Fasto, Cersei, Sprite, revokes her powers and is turned into a regular human um but fasto cersei and who is the third one that stays there's one more that stays well, on stays. earth oh kingo yeah kingo stays um and sprite obviously but she's human at the end right and so these three are still on earth and then Arishem appears and basically like is like, yo, what the fuck? Why'd you guys do this? And then kidnaps them into uh, outer space, into the cosmos. So yeah. that, I felt, that kind of felt abrupt at the end. That was but, uh, super abrupt, wasn't it? But the, like, the climax itself, I enjoyed. And then like the denouement was kind of abrupt. Yeah. Um, I thought the, the big finale, like I, I tweeted about this, but like, the last 30 minutes of the movie, I mean, it's just straight up CG, like all over the place. The editing is like, it doesn't really ever make you understand what the hell is going on in relation to anything else. Like it's, you know, as soon as, cause, cause the characters are facing all these different threats, but you don't really understand why some threats are the way they are. For example, Icarus, he gets chained up essentially okay how why you've been talking about i mentioned this earlier he's the biggest he's the strongest we could all of us combined couldn't possibly stop icarus but fastos just randomly makes chain or something or or handcuffs to keep this guy on the beach um and meanwhile you have spina going against on her own against the one deviant that has been that was that was very that was like wait this guy's been built up the whole time and then he just kind of like she kills him in the cave like and he says nothing of any like value or merit or importance like he's kind of like it's almost like this shakespearean diatribe about i can't even remember what the hell it was it, it just it just amounts to nothing and then in the next second she literally turns him into like ham uh by carving him up and uh and then of course there's the showdown with sprite um where she kind of she betrays Cersei. Yeah, that was Cersei went from stabbed and injured to then like sprinting across the <laughs> the volcanic explosion like nothing. Yeah. Uh so they completely ignore that. Um I guess she was fine. She's that's not a power of hers, but I guess maybe she has a little something something going on. Um so she gets stabbed, she gets back up. Also, the entire movie they're like oh, uh Cersei, you can't do that. Like there's no way you could possibly do that. You couldn't possibly change this um, celestial into a different matter and like stop it. And then I guess at the end, like she just can, she just does. And there's no real, there's no real revelation. There's no like power up or anything for her. Like, and there's no, there's no logical processes to get to that point. She just does because the movie needs her to, otherwise the planet's going to fucking blow up. Um which maybe would have made for a more interesting ending, honestly. But uh, oh, and then at the end, she has enough residual magic juice to uh, to conveniently make Sprite into a human, which I guess is something she can do now. Um, it just it, none of it. It just all these things rapidly happen in the last 30, 25 minutes, and it all was cg and kind of nonsensical and that was really like up through the middle of the movie and kind of going into the third act where they team back up they get fastos they go on to the go back to the ship they meet back up with makari i was like you know what i've kind of been liking this like this isn't bad this is not bad i, can, I think this might actually be kind of good 
and then um all that goodwill that they kind of earned up to that point like just i felt like during the last 30 minutes my eyes were like glazing over and it, it was just pretty nonsensical unfortunately um but we do have uh last two things here post credit scenes how did we feel about these we were t- we were talking live as you were watching me so i kind of have an idea of what what you took away from it but Right. Well, obviously, the unfortunate news about the first, the mid credit scene was that it was not a surprise for a lot of people. The uh, the variety spoilers got out from the premiere that yeah. literally announcing that Harry Styles was in this movie playing Eros, a.k.a. Star Fox, the brother of Thanos, uh, uh, who is also in Eternal, right? Um, mm. Or in some, he's some like, cosmos being um but because thanos is a titan but yes but harry but eros is telling them like let's go find more eternals basically and like that he is in the same position as our eternals who have just figured out that that they have been under this spell basically for centuries so anyway uh we knew that was coming but it still was very uh like I still enjoyed that scene quite a bit. Like obviously Harry Styles is just like freaking magnetic and charming. And like, he has the perfect energy for this, like galactic cosmos. Like he, I feel like he fits the vibe of like a guardians or a, a eternals even for like the, the, the fun light energy there. So I was very excited to see him come in, even though I knew it was coming. Um, Patton Oswald as his little sidekick looked awful the cgi was rough for uh for my little guy i don't even know his name his name is pip the troll pip the troll um but good friend of the podcast pat Oswald, my my sweet sweet friend from the ted lasso premiere can't believe he didn't let it slip that uh he was in this uh i thought we had something real Patton, but anyway uh I, i think my theater still had like a good reaction even though like the girl next to me, it was like, she was a big Marvel fan. And like, she was maybe like a college student, early twenties and like had brought her, her boyfriend. And he had like, it sounded just from like hearing them discuss, like he had seen some of them, but not all of them. Um, and like, she like knew her shit and like knew that this was coming. Um, but like, she was still just like excited, like similar reaction to me, but like overall the, the theater seemed to even if they did know about it, they were still excited. It had a good reaction. Um, I can't imagine, like, as far as, like, plot development goes, like, that wasn't, like, the biggest post credit scene or anything. But, like, I can't imagine if that, if, like, no one had known that was coming. Like, imagine just Harry Styles showing up in the MCU. <laughs> like, I, I feel like that would have been, like, people would have, like, lost their shit. Um, yeah. You know, well, that's the funny thing is I knew, of course, I read the, the leak. So I knew that this And I will say, was- wait, hold, before you get, I will say, I didn't even, like, I didn't look for this leak. I didn't see anything about it. Like, someone who's not, who I follow, who's not even, like, a movie person or anything, just happened to, like, quote, tweet something about it. And I, like, I wasn't searching for this. It wasn't even, like, hashtag Eternals or anything. I just, like, involuntarily saw it. So that's what made it so much worse. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about like the plot leak from last year. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So I knew that this character was showing up. Um, and there had been, there had been rumors, to be fair, um, that Harry Styles was going to be in this movie. Uh, but it wasn't really clear who that might be. And then, of course, it, it was spoiled by Variety that he was playing the post credits character, Star Fox, Thanos' brother. Um, not a big deal. I mean, it was kind of weird when he just walked out and it was like, yeah, yeah, that's Harry Styles in a costume. Um, we'll see. We'll see. He didn't say a whole lot. We didn't really get, a, I didn't like get a whole lot of vibes from him. Apparently in the comics, like his main power or ability is like this godlike character is to just get people to have sex with him. So sounds about right for Harry Styles. That fits. Um, we'll see. I imagine that's probably not going to play too much of a factor in the movies. Probably. Hey, they did one sex scene. Now they're ready to let it rip. They're going to just let Harry Styles rip. Um, I will say, I, when I when I first saw, I didn't know that he was going to be accompanied by Pip the Troll, and I saw that little fella come out, <laughs> and I thought they did Harry Styles absolutely <laughs> dirty. 
Like imagine uh, if you had this handsome, this handsome one direction, like beloved person and you made him look like that. Like I, I was shocked for a second. That would have been ugly. No pun intended. Um, but yeah, so then we also have another scene and this was the real surprise because no one had spoiled this somehow or no one was aware of it. Um, but yeah, we did get a scene with Dane Whitman who is played by Kit Harrington. I don't know if we really talked about him that much, um, but he is playing a character who goes on to be a superhero in the comics, the Black Knight. And uh, I'm curious to see where, you know, where that leads and what they kind of leave off with here at the end is that he is given a sword. He like finds out about like his family, like heritage. Um, and we see him open up this old sword and he is kind of about to take it to his hands. And then uh, off screen, we get a voice that says, oh, I'll be careful. You really, you sure you want to do that? Are you sure you want to do that, Mr. Whitman? Mr. Whitman. And that voice sounded so familiar to me and I couldn't figure out who it was. And I was thinking about it afterward and you were getting out of the movie as well. And I was like, hey, who the hell is this? And then we saw online, we saw some other people talk about it, um, that it is in fact uh, the the vampire killer himself, uh, Blade, Blade the Vampire, uh, Mahershala Ali. And that makes sense because he has a sword. Dane Whitman has a sword. Dane Whitman as the Black Knight has some magical things going on. He fights magical beings sometimes as well. Um, so I'm, who knows where the hell that's going, if that's setting up anything real. Um, I'd be more than, ha- I'd be more than happy to watch Kit Harrington swing a sword around some more. Uh, oh, but, for uh, sure. And maybe if there's a team up with Blade, maybe he'll show up in the Blade movie. Who knows? But I, I've um, also heard that we should expect to see Black Knight in the Moon Knight show. Um, that there's some connection there as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that, that might be the next. magic, right? Blade Blade is very far away still, so that might be the next step for seeing this character. Uh, because we'll we'll get Moon Knight before before Blade. But the sword itself, it's called the Ebony Blade. Um, and like you said, it has some some magic as well. It's not just like any old sword. And exactly. there's like a curse that comes along with it. So that's why yes. the the engraving says death is my reward. And mm. it's like the the more blood that is shed by the sword the more bloodthirsty the wielder becomes so okay. it says only those pure of heart can handle the sword or at least that was the story for many years so like basically it sounds like the more people he kills with this the more he has to use it it's going to like take its toll on him um which i would say is pretty normal for the more people you kill that that probably takes a toll on you <laughs> um but there's like associated curses with it um But there was, this is fun. I didn't catch it until I was like reading articles afterwards and explainers. But when the Eternals get back to the ship, when they find Makari, who's been hanging out there, when they like unearth their triangle ship, Thena picks up a sword as they're going through like the different junk that's in there. And Mm -hmm. someone asks if it's the Ebony Blade. And she says, no, it's just Excalibur. Um, Uh, So they kind of tease that that, that for anyone with MCU eagle ears but but I did not. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to hopefully see, I mean, freaking love Jon Snow. I liked the, his character in this. And uh, I mean, we didn't get a ton of him, but it was what we had was nice. So I'm excited to see uh, what comes next for him. And obviously just any hint of Mahershala's impending appearance was I'm, fantastic. I will say the one thing I'm, I like, I'm kind of pissed because and I'm sure there's logistical reasons for this. I'm sure he probably was never even on a set. He probably just did the, the one line on, on a in a studio or something, and they recorded it. Um, but I feel like if you're gonna do that, like get get Mahershala Ali in the damn room, get him dressed up as standing in a corner, stand in the fuck like have him emerge from the shadows all dramatically, like somehow you know he magically got in there. Um, because I mean. Yeah, this is going to be cool for the 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 tiny fraction of people that look this up or well because everybody else is going to have to do what we did and like google it or look on Twitter and see well, like pro- um, the vast majority of people aren't even probably going to do that. They're probably just going to be like, "Oh, okay." I guess. Right. It, that, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. how I felt walking out of it. I was like, "Okay." 
<laughs> like someone said something and that's all I can like take from it. I'll figure out, I guess, at some other point who it might be. And that of course we did, but like how, how epic would it have been if, I mean, Mahershala Ali fucking walks out dressed as a blade with like the sword and the glasses and everything like that, that would have been, I mean, that would have been something pretty, pretty awesome, but maybe, maybe this was a last minute thing. Maybe they're just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks with regards to Dane Whitman's character and, and blade and maybe any, any tenuous connection there. Um, but overall it kind of felt like the very, these credit scenes kind of felt like a fitting end to this movie because they were both interesting but also underwhelming and kind of awkward and messy um they could have been better but that it is, it is what it is at this point i'm well, and i'm interested as well to see where all this goes all these characters all these different plot lines right because there's no like eternals 2 is not on the books yet and they have said like the producers not feige i can't remember who it was it was one of the other like yeah big time marvel producers has said like this is a like take eternals as a standalone movie like i'm sure we'll get some like salma hayek is signed on who died is signed on for like multiple movies so like i'm sure we'll get these characters in different iterations and in like other movies but it's not like this movie was made and we know we're getting eternals 2 in 2024 or something like that so exactly it will be especially with the the mixed reviews um yeah it's obviously it more out. yeah it's not like they're chomping at the bit to go straight into eternals 2 like a dune 2 announcement was coming so right yeah well i guess we can call off the uh, best picture predictions for this one <laughs> <laughs> yeah unfortunately uh I don't, I don't think either of us was ever sold on that but uh <laughs> for anyone who was i don't think it's gonna happen folks any final thoughts on uh, Eternals before we wrap up? Nah, we've said it all. I'm sure people are just sick of me criticizing this movie. But also, I mean, there were things I liked about it. I, I think you, I've kind of let you take the lead on the positives because I agree with you about most of the positives. Um, so I'm kind of maybe playing devil, devil's advocate a little bit here. But Druig, I, I really like the character, especially Druig. Kingo, I thought was very funny, funnier than I expected. Um, some of the visuals I thought were really cool and inspired. And then some of them I thought were just more mediocre. Uh, and I thought that, I mean, it, it there was, was no, there of... was no, um, Kevin Feige head exploding sunset. No, but, there, like, really, I mean, but, but like there was, there, there was. were moments where it was like, this is not MCU green screen. Like, yeah, there, that's true. This that's is, true. this looks nice. There were, there were plenty of moments that I thought looked very appealing. So. Exactly. And the last thing I'll say, this is probably a good sign off point. If nothing else, it has a, a it has a good message like a heartfelt uh you know you know point it's trying to get across and with with its characters and you know i mean it it does you know there's something to be said for the representation in the movie even though i'm not going to try to prop the movie up on that alone um having someone you know deaf a deaf actor playing a deaf character signing and you know is pretty cool in a movie this big and having um you know, some of the other characters. I mean, a Bollywood sequence in, in a MCU movie is not something I ever expected, but I thought it was pretty cool. And I thought it was one of the more interesting sequences in the movie. So, and also there, Bastos a, being a, an open, openly gay superhero. Yeah, um, that was a fun little kind of detour into his uh, suburban life, which was fun. And, and you know, ma- you know, it ma- matches modern day realities. So, I thought if nothing else, there was something to be taken away from that, but I just wish it had been built into a, a better movie. Shout out quick as I pull up the Brian Tyree Henry IMDb page. Fayetteville Zone. Fayetteville Zone, baby. Your, from your stomping ground. 910 represent. Well, there you have it, folks. Eternals. Johnny coming in around a 55, personally 79 for myself. But thank you all for listening. We really appreciate the support week in and week out. We've got some exciting things planned as we move forward into to close out 2021 and move into 2022. And we hope you all stay tuned and get for, get excited about what we have next. Absolutely. And to stay tuned on all that and keep up to date, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, like us on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube. Zach is keeping you entertained with a lot of awesome content over on that channel interviews of course the podcast episodes can be found there as well and all those social media accounts can be found at inside film room 
And while you are at it, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, anywhere you find a podcast. We are there. And come back next week. The main event is Spencer. Like I said earlier, we will be talking a little bit of red notice as well because I just have to get it off my chest. But come back for Princess Diana, Kristen Stewart. We're talking Spencer. We will see you then. Thank you.